Hello and welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Today we will hear from Joe Speed, VP of Product at Apex AI, a California-based company focused on building an operating system for the autonomous software-first vehicles of the future. I'm joined today by Joe Speed, the VP of Product at Apex AI. Great to be here, Abate. Is Joe Speed your real name? <laughs> It, it is. I come from a long line of uh, military pilots. So that's kind of the family business. My dad, his brother, both grandfathers. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very fitting name uh, for what you're actually doing with Apex AI. So could you give us a little bit of background on what you're, you guys are doing over there? Our special skill is taking open source mm -hmm. and making and hardening it. So making it deterministic, real time functionally safe, certifiable, and then safety certifying it to the highest levels. And so our first product is the Apex OS, which is a ROS2 distro, and that's mm -hmm. certified to the highest levels of automotive safety, which is ISO 26262 ASIL D. And so mm -hmm. we, we um, uh, so that's what we do is uh, we have a hardened Cert safety certified ROS2 distro that is being used by car makers, truck makers, tractor makers, and uh, a few other people as well. Mm -hmm. So essentially at Apex AI, you're building a operating system that is the core of what cars of the future, especially autonomous cars, are going to be using. Yeah, and I guess technically you could say it's a, it's a meta OS or a vehicle OS. So what we provide is it runs on top of a what you think of as a traditional automotive operating system, like you know an, uh, an RTOS, a real-time operating system, like a QNX, a Green Hills, a Pike OS, uh, or in the case of some of the infotainment, like a Linux with preempt RT, real-time kernel uh, patch. And, but as far for the application developers, we provide the SDK, the framework, the tools, the middleware for them to develop, to quickly develop safe applications mm -hmm. that they can then certify for series production vehicles. Mm -hmm. And so what are these applications um, that they would be building? Well, it had started out as, you know, the co-founders of our company have deep, rich background in autonomous driving. So... Um, Jan Becker has been doing autonomous driving since the late 90s. Uh, Dayan has been doing autonomous driving and autonomous uh, agricultural vehicles for very many years. Um, they were some of the very first people to take Ross and use it to do autonomous driving in vehicles. And they worked with uh, Brian Gerke and all of the team at Open Robotics to design, architect, and develop ROS2. And so mm -hmm. we've been a big contributor to ROS2. We're on the ROS2 Technical Steering Committee and um, you know, do a lot of heavy contribution to the community, both to ROS2 and to the default ROS middleware in ROS2 Galactic, which is Eclipse Cyclone with the built-in Isrix uh, zero copy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so before we, we dive in deeply into what you guys are doing with Ross, which is really, really interesting and cool. Um, the the software that you guys are developing, the middleware, is this targeted towards, say, the autonomous algorithms for being able to navigate and detect people and then move the car? Or is this uh, something a little bit more general? Well, it's, you know, if you think about how Ross is amazingly flexible and ubiquitous, right? People use mm -hmm. Ross for all kinds of crazy things, including lots of things that you wouldn't normally define as being a robot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and so, you know, we had started out to our thought around Apex OS was and Apex Middleware is very much around autonomous driving, right? So we knew that when people were developing autonomous driving, they need the SDK, the framework, the middleware to speed up how easily, how quickly they can develop autonomous driving and have it be safe. The bit that surprised us that was maybe not so expected is, you know, we, we have all these automaker and tier one customers using us for autonomous, but then they started taking our tools and moving them sideways into other automotive domains. So instead of autonomous driving or in addition to autonomous driving, which is more of a future thought, 
they're using it to develop things that go into cars now, right? So mm. um, advanced driver assistance system, uh, lane centering, adaptive cruise control, uh, automatic emergency braking, the powertrain, cockpit functions, uh, telematics, uh, all kinds of different things. And so that's the bit that's a little bit um, surprising and wonderful is mm -hmm. uh, in the same way that Ross is finding its way into all kinds of unexpected corners of the world, um, we are finding ourselves getting deployed into unexpected corners of the automotive industry. Yeah, I and mean, what's great about that is that you don't have to wait until autonomous um, technology matures or improves, you can immediately start testing out and building the infrastructure. Well, exactly, because you know, there are, you know, pick a number, right? There's, you know, some tens of thousands of autonomous vehicle, but there are tens of millions of regular vehicles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so if you compare it to what the, what the operating system or whatever it is that, that is in the current present day cars, mm -hmm. how does this differ from that? And what's the incentive that is giving automakers um, and the people who are developing ADAS and other features to yeah, switch over. So, so there's a few things, you know, you, and we should talk a bit about, you know, kind of the architectural technical differences, but one is just the development process. So today, what here's what happens at automakers, right? Whether they admit it publicly or not, this is the process. Um, the at mo many, somewhere between many and most automakers, they use ROS and ROS2 to prototype new features. So they have an idea, they need a proof of concept, and so they use ROS and ROS2 to develop it. When they, when they have a good prototype and they like it, then what they do is they throw that over to the fence to another group that develops a pilot implementation. So they throw all that code away and do a new implementation. And then when they like that, they throw it over the fence to a third group who develops the, um, the functionally safe certifiable version that would go into series production. Well, what that means is for every idea, for every feature, for every new application you're doing, you're developing it three times. And this is not weeks or months, this is years, right? This is why it takes from like, you know, idea conception to showing up in a production vehicle at your local dealer is, you know, on a, in best case, you're talking about like, oh, I don't know, five years, six years, right? You know, eight years is very normal. In some cases, it's 12 years. Mm -hmm. And so why do that? If we could just help you, if you're prototyping in Ross and Ross 2, if we can help you get a path to bring that like more directly into production, okay, um, mm -hmm. we're going to shave years and uh, years and uh people and uh, many, many millions of dollars from the cost of each of these things. Yeah. So the people who are developing, um, let's, let's talk about like ADAS. Um, sure. The, is that like the Toyotas and the Volkswagens of the world or is that subsidiary companies that are designing this and they have some sort of robotics background that they decided to uh, use Ross? Well, th these days, um, most of the companies have some group of people or people within them with some robotics background, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, ADAS, I mean, these are really op robotic domains, whether they call it that or not, right? You know, the, the they're doing use cases and things that would look very familiar to roboticists, especially any that have worked on like AMRs, right? Like if you've worked on a turtle bot, you probably kind of understand what they are trying to do. Mm -hmm. Um the uh but this work is happening at the automakers themselves so right in automotive we talk about there's there's automotive oems um so that is your you know that's your your daimler your toyota your volvo your jaguar land rover right it's those kinds of companies you have what's called your tier one so these are the big main suppliers who do like complete systems for an automaker so that's people like continental ZF, right? These kinds of companies. Uh, and then there's a lot of others, right? You know, there's secondary suppliers, there's um, ISVs, there's people who specialize in developing specific kinds of software that go into such systems. Um, and you've got the silicon makers, you've got, you know, there's an entire ecosystem, right? It, mm -hmm. it kind of spiders out. So 
you know, for each vehicle that gets made, like ultimately you're talking about thousands of suppliers made something that went into that vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so in the vision of Apex AI, then are all of these companies as they're passing from uh, maybe one company to another in this chain, are they all using the same um, product that you guys are developing as a sort of middle ground so that they don't have to rebuild the wheel every time. So I think yes, to some extent, but you know, I'll be specific. Like we're a software company. So where we fit Mm -hmm. is, you know, the pieces in a car that run software. So you're Mm -hmm. talking about, you know, ECUs um, that, which are, you know, uh, typically those are, you know, somewhere, you know, kind of for sake of argument, let's say something like a Raspberry Pi ish in terms of compute power, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, whether we're talking about, you know, a Pi Zero or Pi Four, um, but it's kind of in that ballpark. You have your MCUs. These are the microcontrollers, right? So closest analog for your listeners would be like, you know, like, a, was it the S- SB32, right? It's it's that kind of class of compute, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and in a vehicle, you know, it's pretty normal that you're going to have You know, depending on model, manufacturer, you know, a a pretty good frame of reference would be 120 to 180 of these things. Uh, So think about, you know, imagine if your robot has like 180 different computers in it and each of them is developed by, you know, they're not, (laughs) it doesn't mean 180 different companies, but you could easily have them coming from a half dozen or a dozen different companies and they're using different tools, different operating systems, their tool chains are different, their test methods are different. Um, And now you're trying to collapse that together so that you can have a smaller number of bigger computers. And, Mm -hmm. you know, this is really hard. So with Ross, you know, Ross was developed to, you know, earlier on, everybody was building their own robots. So no two robots were the same. So you've got a lot of emphasis on portability, a lot of emphasis on having some nice hardware and device abstractions. So, you know, if this robot has a different camera than that robot, I can still get it figured out and get it to work. I don't, mm-hmm. I don't have to throw the application away. And that's one of the things that's a little crazy in automotive is, you know, you start swapping out some hardware pieces underneath you might actually have to scrap and completely rewrite an application because you don't have these kinds of abstractions. You know, you don't have this ability to like, just pick up your software, like, you know, oh, I was running on, you know, ECU A today, and, but I can't get it because of COVID supply chain. So I'm moving to ECU B from a different manufacturer. That's not so easy. Um, but, you know, for Ross, these are normal problems. And so the things we do by building upon Ross, using modern language, modern tools, having these kinds of abstraction error uh, layers, you know, that's how, if, like, if you visit our headquarters in Palo Alto, there's an entire farm of automotive computers from all of our customers with different silicon, different operating systems, completely different things, you know, everything from a TI to a Qualcomm to a uh, NVIDIA drive to a Renesis, right? Um, Our car and and all of these running different things, but for us, they're all running the same code. And those mm-hmm. things get exercised and stressed and tested all day, every day. Um, we have a CI farm on AWS Graviton 2. So something interesting is uh, at the moment, all of my customers have ARM in their car. So we have a build farm on AWS Graviton 2. So we're able to test on ARM and then deploy to our ARM automotive ECU farm of physical ECUs. And that gives the customers the reassurance that they can now take that code and develop for that target device. And they're not going to have issues, right? They're not figuring it out for the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So are are you guys the only ones who are using Ross real time on a car um, as as the infrastructure to control it? Absolutely not. 
So ROS and um, more specifically ROS2 is being used by a ton. You know, that is kind of the default platform for anyone doing R&D in any space, right? You know, AMRs, AGVs, forklifts, drones, whatever, right? The um, uh, What's different is we're the only one who have a safety, a real-time deterministic, functionally safe and safety certified, okay, mm -hmm. uh, ROS2 distro. So one way to think of it, so, you know, um, you know, Everyone uses Linux, right? And but uh, when you need to deploy it to like enterprise scale and have it be hardened and supported and secure uh, and all of these things, you know, you might do something like you get Red Hat. So like Red Hat is a hardened commercial uh, Linux distro. In that same way, what we offer Apex OS is a hardened commercial ROS2 distro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So well, what has the journey been like getting to there um, and all the <laughs> contributions you guys have made to Ross in the process? Well, it's it's been a hard work, but you got to remember, I'm Johnny come lately, right? So here's the thing. Uh, I wanted to join Apex years ago, okay? And my wife was like, no, I've had enough of your startup nonsense. Like, why don't you just be their friends? You, you know, if you love them, you don't have to join the company to help them. So just be their friends and help them. And that's what I've been doing for several years now. And uh, and then, uh, but then when we got up, uh, you know, closer to Thanksgiving, she actually gave me a head nod and said, yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> and, and so I called them on Friday and we had details sorted out by the Monday and here I am. Uh, so I know lots about Apex. I've been working with them for years, but I've actually only been an employee since November, right? The mm -hmm. end of November, first day of December. Yeah. And, uh, so, so, but uh, yeah, I can answer your question. So, you know, uh, a lot of heavy lifting. You know, you look at what Jan and Dayan did working with Brian Gerke and the great crew at Open Robotics around architecting, designing, developing ROS2, um, all the contributions there, um, getting Apex as a company off the ground. Um, and we had some really great early investors, you know, um, some Silicon Valley VCs and people like uh, Airbus. Uh, Toyota Research, um, people who believe very early in our mission. And we've been uh, blessed to get amazing engineers. And the, you know, a lot of people are very passionate about this topic. A lot of people have deep skill and experience in robotics and automotive. Um, but like people come from automotive, you know, you can imagine if you're a developer, it's a little frustrating that when you invent a new feature, you don't see it on the dealer floor for many, many years. And they want to change that, right? They want, how do we get automotive to move at cloud speed? And mm -hmm. so that's what we've been working on from an SDK framework tools and middleware perspective. Um, others have been working on it from a, all the infrastructure around that, right? So, so how do you take cloud style DevOps and bring that into automotive? How do you bring cloud style virtualization, hypervisors, container, Docker, Kubernetes, all these things, um, and bring that into a car and make it functionally safe and safety certified? So that's, you know, people like our friends, you know, Arm, AWS, Conti, Suse, Red Hat, Bosch, right? They're all mm -hmm. working on this thing called SOFI, the SOA, FEE, Scalable Open Architecture for Embedded Edge. Uh, but the thing that's convenient is it sounds like a girl's name, right? So you just say Sophie. It's it's easy. It's it's hard to spell, but it's easy to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so they're working on that. So I see that they go together like yin and yang, right? So we're focused on, you know, how do you develop modern applications that are portable and easily virtualized? And they're dealing with the how do I virtualize? How do I deploy? How do I do over the air update? How do I support mixed criticality? So this is a big deal. So it used to be every single function in a car has its own computer, mm -hmm. which think if you were building a robot, like that's just insane, right? <laughs> but yeah. this is how it was done. 
And, uh, and so now as they collapse that together with software defined vehicle, we actually have multiple domains running on the same physical computer. Well, not all domains are created equal. Like one domain is controlling my car radio or my navigation. A different domain is steering, braking, and accelerator. Which of these is kind of more important for keeping people alive, right? And not mm -hmm. injur injuring pedestrians either. And so, you know, having these kind of different critic mix, these different workloads that have different levels, degrees of criticality, and putting them on the same computer, like that's really cool. And and taking all of these different computers that were developed in different ways, if you if you could have, uh, well, you know, in robots today, you oftentimes will have many computers in a larger robot but they're all running the same software, right? They're all running mm -hmm. ROS or ROS2. So it's, if I need to get a bigger computer, a different computer, I'm moving from Intel to ARM to something else, the um, uh, ROS handles that and it gives you those abstraction layers where I can collapse these into a bigger computer. I can virtualize, I can port it from one hardware to a different hardware, right? That's, that's kind of just accepted as normal and easy in robotics, but in automotive, these things are hard. Mm -hmm. And so they, how do you bring this kind of ease that we accept as just for granted in the robotics community and the speed at which we prototype and deploy in the robotics community, right? Like, you know, when people like uh, Fetch and ClearPath develop a new feature, like, you know, you're not waiting until 2026 to get it in your next robot, right? It's, it's coming in the next update. Mm -hmm. It's coming next week. So, so that's what we're trying to help them with. And, uh, and it's been going neat. You know, we've got some really great investors. Not all of our customers are public. Some of our customers are very public, like, you know, ZF, Continental are extremely public about how ambitious they are, the things they're doing with us. Um, mm -hmm. Others are not. But if you look at who our investors are, it gives you kind of a clue of what's happening in the industry, right? You've got your, your Toyota Research, your Continental, ZF. Jaguar, Land Rover, Volvo, Agco, Agco, that's, that's, that's agricultural vehicles, that's tractors, that's like how people get fed, like, that's pretty important. Um, uh, truck maker, um, that can't be named, uh, the uh, Hella, which is another um, big supplier, and God, I'd be embarrassed I'm leaving somewhere else. And then we have a community of, uh, you know, technology investors, VCs who really appreciate what what we do and and help get us off the ground very early. So God bless to them. Yeah. And so one of the interesting things is that now as you not only work across multiple companies in the same industry, you're working across yeah. different industries and in agriculture and um, sure. trucks. So um, does this mean that they all then get to share from the same learnings and then whatever software that you're developing for um, this platform now um, is now going to be shared by anybody who can jump on the platform as a future customer? Say, so I'll say absolutely yes with one big caveat. So we respect our customers intellectual property. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so working with them, you know, we learn, we improve the product, the improving the product, making it more capable, flexible, more performant, lower latency, lower jitter, um, uh, the ease of getting these kinds of performance gains, like the, the things that are in the, the new um, uh, Apex OS executor is just shocking improvement compared to what's in the open source, right? It's really kind of incredible. Um, the latency, the jitter, the very low CPU cost that it provides. Can you say that again? What was that? Uh, well, in ROS too, you have a thing called the executor, right? So mm -hmm. executor decides, you know, what things get done when and what order. And uh, so we've developed one that is real-time deterministic and functionally safe. And it does some rather clever things like if, if I have a graph, right? So here's the nodes, here's the things that happen. Um, we can actually take those and collapse them, collapse those down into, into a thread. So they get executed in sequence within the same thread. So you never even get context switching of switching out of the thread. And mm -hmm. we get radical improvement in the jitter 
and latency and CPU cost for that. And um, I'll send you I'll send you a paper. It's actually in a blog that we published about our new product release, and um, and so that's some publicly available information. It's kind of great. And then yeah, and then the things that we've been doing around the Iceric zero copy and the Cyclone DDS. These are Eclipse Foundation projects that we contribute to, and uh, things like you know with DDS UDP four megabyte camera on something that's like two thirds as powerful as a Raspberry Pi three, right? One of these automotive mm -hmm. computers, you know, it's 25 millisecond. You're like, no, oh, okay. Sounds about right. Well, we can do those same four megabyte camera images pub sub between uh, inter process and tra process in 60 microseconds. And we can mm -hmm. do it at 60 microseconds, no matter if it's a one kilobyte message or a four megabyte message. So this fixed latency, very, very low jitter, um, uh, fixed CPU cost, regardless of message size, that that's kind of big. And mm. for the automakers, you know, when you're doing functional safety, you basically have this budget, you have a time budget of, you know, I have to complete this task within this very small time budget or else I put someone's life at risk. And if we can make it faster and more efficient and lower jitter, that gives back time budget and CPU cycles for more interesting things like, like your algorithms, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so you guys also recently got um, some publicity for doing uh, participating in the uh, autonomous race challenge. Um, yes. Could you dive into that a bit? Sure. It's, uh, you know, a a as you can see, the <laughs> it's a topic we love very much. So uh, Apex is on every single Indy Autonomous Challenge race car, so all the universities, uh, but Apex contributed uh, code and even Indy Autonomous Challenge specific contributions that we have made to ROS2 and the uh, ROS middleware, the ROS2 Galactic default ROS middleware, which is Eclipse Cyclone DDS with the built-in ICERIG zero copy, uh, is used by every team. So when Indy Autonomous Challenge started, all the teams were using commercial software, right? Commercial DDS. Um, but by the time they got to Indy, all of them had switched to ROS2 Foxy with the Eclipse Cyclone DDS with um, uh, IEC specific contributions from us and friends. So people like, you know, um, Robotech AI, AD Link, Bosch, Tier 4, Open Robotics, um, and friends. Uh, but the team that won was Toom. And so there's a couple things going on there. So one is uh, Toom upgraded to ROS2 Galactic. So they got the very latest of all the improvements we had made for the ND Autonomous Challenge. Okay. Mm -hmm. Also, um, our co-founder Dayan went to Tomb, so we have a kind of a soft spot in our heart for uh, for Tomb, and so uh, all, we supported and helped all the teams, but gave some extra personal attention and assistance to Tomb, and so Tomb won the million dollars. Right? Um, I'm not saying that they did. <laughs> so they're super talented, right? And they wrote great algorithms. They're amazingly well organized. So I'm not saying they won because of us. I'm just saying we helped them and they won. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you, you know, you mentioned a couple of the changes. Oh, go ahead. That's the tomb car. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and what what were some of the changes that uh, that you guys had to make uh, for yeah. the Indie Autonomous Challenge? And I'm sure yeah. you know this is definitely an edge case um, compared well, to the overall product. So yes and no. So in terms of the improvements, um, I'll just tell you, uh, Ross Bag Two in Ross Two Foxy is broken. Okay, <laughs> uh, it is. So this vehicle, what are you talking about? You've got six cameras at up to 155 frames per second. Mm -hmm. Three flash LIDARs at, depending on how you set them up, you know, either 20 hertz or 30 hertz. Um, so 120 degree flash LIDARs uh, on this. Uh, three radars. Uh, it's not four radars because it turns out that a rear face facing radar of one car will interfere with a forward facing radar, a different car, because they're all running on the same frequency. Ah, uh, yeah. Oops. <laughs> so three radar. Uh, so two. what, two in the front and then? Yeah, yeah. Where... So, uh, oh, so 
um, uh, narrow field of view, long range radar forward facing, and then two short range wide angle radars, um, left, right, port starboard, right? The um, uh, two GNSS IMUs, G GNSS with IMUs and each GNSS has two antennas. And they did something clever here, which is um, one GNSS has an antenna front and rear, and the other GNSS has its antennas left and right. And from that, we can actually get enough granularity to not just know where the car is, but when the car drifts through the corners, we know mm. how many degrees of drift and the steering can, uh, can compensate. Yeah, even with the amount of error that is uh, inherent to GNSS? Well, it's, and it's GNSS with RTK, to be clear. So that helps. The, um, and then there's, there's a drive-by-wire system from our friends at New Eagle, um, uh, safety MCU front-ending the, uh, the Schaeffler Paravan drive-by-wire, you know, so th there's a lot of amazing technology in these vehicles, right? So, you know, you got your, your Luminar, your Aptiv Radar, your um, uh, Allied Vision Mako cameras, 80-link computer, um, uh, what else? Uh, autonomous stuff, um, Hexagon, Hexagon, Novatel, the GNSS. Um, there's, there's a lot going on. Like these are million dollar robots, right? And, yeah. and two weeks before CES, Polymoves, the Italian team, they took theirs out to Apple. Uh, so Apple owns a, uh, a prove a dry, a, a driving proving ground. Okay for autonomous driving. And it has a five mile long high speed oval track. So Polymove, the Italians took it out to the proving ground and spun it up to 176 miles per hour, like 283 kilometers per hour, which I think is like world's fastest. You know, I, <laughs> the, ro the robo race people will complain because they'll say like, well, you did it different. We did ours on the runway and you did yours on an oval track. But mm -hmm. so I, whatever. Um, they're, they're not, Polymove is not done setting new speed records. They're going to go do some more. Um, but then Ooh. like two weeks later, they went out to the Las Vegas Motor Speedway, which is not that big of an oval, right? I think it's like a one and a half mile oval. And they did a hundred. They hit 173 miles an hour while passing Tomb to win the race. Oh wow! Wow. Have there been any accidents? Oh, plenty. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the thing that's so genius about the Indy Autonomous Challenge is there is zero risk. Okay. And when I say risk, I talk about something important, like people getting injured. Property damage? Oh, yeah, we've wrecked plenty of these, but it's okay. We repair them. We just build more of them. Like, that's the thing that's so awesome about um, about racing. Like, when I explain to my friends in Japan about the Indy Autonomous Challenge, you know, they say, well, Joe, you say that it has no risk, but we don't understand these words that you're saying, right? Because in <laughs> Japan, if you have a fender bender, right, like... If you have some little minor thing in your autonomous vehicle program, it's a great shame. It's a great loss of face. But in motorsports, like, let me tell you a scenario. It's Sunday. You put a bunch of race cars out on the track and they go out and they race and some of them crash. Is that unusual or is that just a normal Sunday? Like in mm -hmm. motorsports, that's normal. You expect it. It's part of the excitement. Okay. The, and that's true here. The difference here is when these cars crash, I cry a little because I've been working with these kids for two years now and like I feel their pain. So when they laugh, I laugh. When they cry, I cry. When they're happy and jumping up and down, I'm happy and jumping up and down. Yeah, not to mention it's a million dollar car. So <laughs> well, there there is that. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm I'm happy when they crash, but you know, it's you know, it's it's like Steve Rogers. You know, we have the technology. We can we can build them better, stronger, faster than before. Yeah, and it actually, it, it proves to be a really good place to test things and and to be a little bit aggressive without fear of failure. Oh, Steve uh, Austin, which is sorry, I get my Steves mixed up. <laughs> 
Yeah. No, it gives them a, a, a place that they can uh, they can test without fear of failure, which is um, yeah. also Absolutely. always important to progress. And, and they do they do a ton in simulation and that really helps. And I think we're going to put a lot of effort into that, um, try to get the simulation better and better, do virtual simulation so even new universities can join the program and get involved. And uh, so the simulation is a key thing. You know, you don't want a situation where like, you crash the car the first time you put it on the track. Um, mm -hmm. Something else is fun though, is for just getting the vehicle around and, uh, and collecting data, you can remote control it using, so what does every kid know how to use? What piece of gear? An Xbox game controller, okay? So it's kind of a treat to see the car doing laps being followed by an SUV. And in the passenger seat is a kid with a laptop and an Xbox controller, like driving this million dollar robot as it does <laughs> laps around the track, collecting point clouds, collecting imagery, building data sets that they can then use to train their algorithms. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, you mentioned uh, simulations. Do you guys also um, offer a simulation package or do you guys use uh uh, simulation packages to test out. Updates. So for um, for my company for Apex, it works with the normal ones. Basically, any simulation that works with Ross and Ross Two also works with what we do. Um, our customers also integrate them with their you know very expensive automotive grade uh, simulation packages that they use in their own development. Mm -hmm. For the Indy Autonomous Challenge, you know, they had started with um, ANSYS Simulator for the first half of last year. Uh, Mid-year, a lot of the teams pivoted to uh, SVL Sim, SVL Simulator from LG Silicon Valley Labs. Um, and with all the plugins developed by Gaia and contributed by some engineers from Blue Origin, um, we got that to where it's like perfect digital twin, like just really dialed in. And then LG decided we're not in the simulation business anymore. And so all the code is still there in public. Everyone can still use it, uh, but LG is no longer contributing to it. So yeah, definitely. So what's next at Apex AI? Uh, more things, more vehicles, more cars, trucks, and tractors. And, and you'll start to see us showing up in other industries that have similar requirements, right? So you know, um, uh, the, you know, AMRs, AGVs, uh, things that drive outdoors, um, things that go off road, things that go indoors, uh, all of that. And, uh, uh, and hopefully, uh, space. So, uh, you know, NASA and Blue Origin issued an RFI for Space Ross, which we replied to. And in Space Ross, they were saying, you know, what we really want is just if somebody would fork Ross 2 and make it deterministic, real time, functionally safe and safety certifiable to the highest level. And, you know, we're kind of like, um, we, hey, <laughs> over here, we did that. And, uh, and so we're talking with our friends Picnic. Um, so Picnic are just awesome. Dave Coleman and crew over there, and they do uh, move it, move it to uh, eventually move it three. They do things for NASA. They have things on the International Space Station, and they have customers that have requirements right now today for real time deterministic. And so, you know, I'm hoping to put all the pieces together. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. <laughs> Happy to. Hey, real pleasure. And that brings us to the end of today's episode. You can find loads more news and views on robotics, as well as all our previous episodes at robohub.org forward slash podcast. And if you have topic ideas, suggestions for interviewees, or are interested in joining the Robohub podcast team, we would love to hear from you. Just email our podcast lead at abate.de.mey at robohub.org. We'll be back with another episode in about two weeks' time. Until then, goodbye.